Salutations, one and all, and welcome to Ruby Revisited. In this entry, let's analyze the fight between Blake and Yang against Adam from Season 6. So, first things first, let's begin with examining each side's objective. Adam is a bit complicated here. At first, he seems to just be wanting to hurt Blake as much as he can, but as the fight progresses, he shifts into a more lethal mindset, enacting what he believes is revenge. Ah, Adam. It feels like you were supposed to be two characters that got spliced into one. The freedom fighter that went too far and became evil, and the obsessed ex. Blake is the initial one to face him, and her goal is simple self-defense. Yang joins her later, and while her motive could have been for vengeance, she instead seems more interested in defending Blake. But that aside, on to the fight proper. So Blake came to this tower in the hopes of disabling the security systems so that the main cast can escape Argus and bring the Relic of Knowledge to Ironwood in Atlas. However, it would seem as though Adam has tracked her here and has already disposed of the guards on site. I have to question how just one man was able to take down the forces here. If this tower has security systems that need to be protected, you would think that there would be more military personnel here to protect it. Yes, Adam is portrayed to be unstoppable, but a few dozen soldiers, all armed with automatic weapons, should be enough to stop just about any individual. Combine that with them being led by someone with a semblance, and there shouldn't have been much Adam could do by himself. Sure, he could take some of them down, but this place really should have had more troops on site to prevent this very thing. Blake has already encountered him, though, by the looks of how this fight starts out, as she's already running from him. So we don't see just how this fight began, but we can look at where they are positioned to try to draw some information. Blake is a level above Adam, indicating that she was either climbing the tower when she became aware of him, or tried to run from him by going up here. I've said it before, but going up is bad in a fight. Eventually, you're going to run out of up, and then you're cornered. I also have to question the black cloth that Adam has over his eyes. Yes, I am fully aware that we are not going for realism here, but analysis is fun, so I'm going to do it anyway. This veil over his eyes would make it very hard for him to see. Now, many historical helms had limited visibility, but the trade-off was that they provided protection for your head, and in a fight, you don't generally need to see up or down as much as you do in front of you into the sides. Adam is just reducing his vision without gaining any of that defensive bonus. We see later that his left eye is all manky, so it probably doesn't work at all, or if it does, not to its full potential. But that just makes him hampering his visibility even worse. It's not even like that would help hide his identity, as he's still wearing his White Fang getup, and most of Remnant has probably heard of him. At least those like Atlas Security. So that really doesn't do anything positive for him. It's nice to finally have time to ourselves, don't you think? Leave me alone! Blake shoots twice at Adam, commanding him to back off, and Adam blocks these two rounds with his sword. Realistically, that would be difficult at best, but he just pulls it off with no problem. And this brings me back to a point I made in my video on weapons and remnant. The guns, by and large, don't seem to have much kinetic energy behind them. They just plink off his blade without affecting him or it at all. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to try that in real life. Even if the shots were guaranteed to hit the blade and not me, 
Anything bigger than tiny rounds would, at the very least, damage the blade. Never mind anything else that could go wrong. I do like that he keeps both hands on his weapon, though, at opposite ends to provide a stable block. It's something that I really don't like in a lot of Star Wars media, where you see someone block a strike in a really weak stance that would realistically just cause their own blade to swing back into them. This was a nice touch. Blake then tries to escape, grabbing onto a support cable to act as a zip line. It's a good idea trying to get off the vertical structure, but grabbing onto that with your open hand like that isn't a great strategy. That's going to cause friction burns, or at the very least cause you to expend some aura protecting yourself from them. Blake's weapon does have a rather lengthy ribbon on it that's been shown to support a good amount of weight, so she could have thrown that over the cable and used it instead. Adam, however, uses his semblance to unleash an energy wave that cuts the cable, causing Blake to fall back onto the platform. Now, we haven't gotten a good look at this tower yet, so unless the lower platforms are larger than the upper ones, she should have fallen straight to the ground. The lower platforms may very well be larger, given that things like cell towers in our own world sometimes taper like that, so I'm not going to knock points off unless we get a better shot later on, showing the walkways being the same size. Adam is a bit slow on the uptake, though, as he only starts moving towards Blake after she's already recovered. He starts with a big, leaping slash, but leaves himself exposed as he overswings. If Blake had recovered faster, she'd have been able to get a free hit on him. Look at how neither his blade nor scabbard are protecting his body. He then follows this with a second leaping strike, which gives Blake ample time to evade him. If he'd just redirected his momentum from his previous attack instead of jumping again, he'd have been much quicker. But Blake succeeded in evading too well, and is now very far away, prompting her to do a jumping attack of her own, complete with a spin. Again, that's slow enough to give Adam time to react, and spinning doesn't add anything noticeable in terms of power. There's seldom a reason to do it. This also leaves Blake, with her back completely exposed to Adam, a position you never want to be in in a fight. Ever. You leave yourself incredibly vulnerable that way, and you can't even really see what your enemy is doing from there. Blake performs a static block over her shoulder, but that's a genuinely horrible position. You have no leverage that way, and Adam should have been able to easily swat aside her weapon and hit her. Except, he draws his blade back way too far for a thrust afterwards, and this strike would never have hit her even if she hadn't moved. His aim was much too far to his left, or right, and Blake was never in any danger from it. Blake does deliver a nice spinning back kick to Adam's face, though. She could have struck him with her blade, but this is a nice way to get a bit of space, which can be helpful if you aren't feeling confident in your position. Kicks do have a lot of energy that they dump into their target. But Dual Wielder, didn't you just say that spins are bad? Correct. In the vast majority of cases, spins are bad. But sometimes they can be useful. Like if you need to pivot to put yourself in a position to properly strike someone. I myself in sparring matches would use spinning back kicks to great effect against aggressive opponents. They'd see my back and rush me, only to run right into my foot. It's a bit of a niche tactic, and I wouldn't always recommend it, but it can be done, though this is more often for unarmed fighting rather than armed fights. Adam closes the distance again, but oof, big oof, quintuple oof. He's holding his sword in a reverse grip. 
If you've watched my videos on fights before, you'll probably know that I hate reverse grips, but long story short, it reduces your range, range of motion, and power substantially. Really, it only works with very short blades at very close range, or in very specific circumstances. Just look at how much farther he needs to move his arm to strike Blake here. If he'd been using his weapon properly, he'd have already struck. I'm not a big fan of Blake's block here either. She's leaving most of her body exposed, which is also not good. You want your weapon between you and your opponent so that you can both attack and defend quickly. Turning your body towards your enemy while also putting your blade way out like this leaves her back completely exposed. Really, Adam could have just adjusted his swing and hit her right along her spine. But as Adam takes a second to correct his horrible sword positioning, Blake does a flip onto the railing while slashing at him. A normal slash would have been quicker, and he wasn't in a particularly good position to defend himself, but she's trying to gain some distance. She jumps off the tower as Adam uses his semblance again, and then uses her own to generate a copy of herself, which seems to give her some knockback, as it launches her forward and upwards enough to grab onto the tower. She does this move a second time to reach the walkway of the second highest platform, and we can see that the platforms are indeed a bit larger as they get closer to the ground, so that earlier bit of choreography wasn't misplaced. I would like to bring up the semblances though. Adam's is a bit wonky in that we don't know just how much energy he can unleash, or how long he can store it for. The way it's used makes it almost seem like it's more of a feature of his sword than anything else. Could he use another weapon and still have the same effect? Does it need to withstand the force of the strike, or could he just pick up a stick if he needed to? Can he not use his semblance at all if he isn't holding a weapon? I have a lot of questions that I wish I knew the answers to. Also, people have questioned a few times why I say that Blake has illusions. Creating a visual copy of yourself falls under that category. Anything that distorts or interferes with someone else's ability to perceive the situation is an illusion, even if it doesn't work quite like Neo or Emerald. But Blake is continuing to go up. Like I said before, she's running out of places to go. She only has one platform above her, and once she gets there, she won't have anywhere else to easily maneuver to. <laughs> But somehow, Adam has gotten up here. How he did that, I can't say. His semblance doesn't allow him to move quickly, and he has no gear that would let him clamber up here quickly, so your guess is as good as mine as to how he jumped up here so quickly. But instead of shooting at her with either the firearm portion of his weapon or using his semblance, he instead throws his weapon at her. Fortunately for him, it bounces right back to him, but what if it didn't? Realistically, it very likely would have either fallen to the ground at Blake's feet, or else fallen off of the tower. If Blake had seen it coming, she could even have caught it. All of these would have left Adam without a weapon at all, except for his dinky little gun that doesn't seem to do much of anything at all. Throwing weapons only work if you've got something else to back it up. Otherwise, there's a good chance that you've just disarmed yourself. I need a weapon. Blake then does the most telegraphed attack that she could possibly have managed, swinging around the tower to do a falling strike onto Adam. I do have to question how she can hook onto things with her weapon, and then seamlessly unhook it off. Rule of cool, I know, but I would like to mention it. But through falling, she puts herself at the mercy of gravity. When you fall, your opponent knows where you're going, and when you're going to be there. Adam could easily have stepped to the side and attacked her as she landed, 
and there's very little she could have done against it. Instead, he does a static block, which at least he again braces properly by using both hands on it. He follows this up with a big swing, giving Blake enough time to do a swing of her own to counter it. The pair progressively overswing more and more as this exchange goes on, which isn't something you want to do. When you overswing, you leave yourself open to attacks as your weapon is no longer in a position to defend you. It also takes longer to mount another strike, as you need to adjust your position from the overswing. This is why many, myself included, refer to it as baseball bat swinging, like how a batter swings the bat all the way around their body. Good for baseball, bad for fighting. The pair then get into the bind, and I will say that at least they don't do that thing that so many fights in media do, where they just push against each other. Adam grabs a hold of Blake's wrist, while Blake grabs at the grip of Adam's sword. This limits how much either of them can do with their weapons. A very interesting scenario. At this point, a kick or knee strike would be the best option, as their blades are too close in this position to be effective. Or if either of them had been dual wielding, they could have struck with the other weapon, but you know. Adam forces Blake back a few steps before throwing her aside, but he just straight up arms the motion. He doesn't get lower than her and lift with his legs. This might have been aura enhanced, but we can't say for certain. What's odd though, is that Blake actually lets go with her offhand before he throws her. Why she did this, I can't say. Perhaps she was going to hit him with that hand? But in so doing, she gave up a hold that could have potentially been valuable to her. She does manage to recover, flipping onto the railing and jumping up to the top platform as Adam uses his semblance again. I will say though, that semblances are supposed to be powered by aura, which also powers a character's aura shield. Liberal use of a semblance should result in aura being used up much more quickly and thus depleting the aura shield. So if Adam keeps spamming it, he's effectively weakening himself. Yang would likely suffer a similar problem, having to use aura to both stop incoming damage and then using more still to make herself stronger, but that's something we'll come to at a later date. Adam then somehow gets up here in the blink of an eye again. Seriously, how is he doing this? He has no movement based ability or equipment, so this should have bought Blake at least a few seconds to orient herself. He then grabs hold of her throat and pushes her back towards the railing. Strangely, in this shot, we can see that he's holding his sword in its scabbard, but in the next, he's got a hold of Blake's wrist. How it attaches to his hip is unknown, but this is an oversight regardless. But this does mean that both of his hands are occupied. Now what could or couldn't happen here isn't exactly clear due to the vague nature of Aura, but Blake could kick or punch him here with complete immunity, possibly even eye gouge him. Strangulation is also a bit of an unknown here, as we don't know if aura shields could stop someone's windpipe from being forcibly compressed like it does for being struck, so it's difficult to say what could really happen here in that regard. But Blake flips herself and Adam over the railing, and the pair fall an exceedingly long distance to the ground, and bizarrely, their auras don't even flare up. Falling from that height would deal a ton of damage to you, so if they weren't protected by aura, they'd be dead, or at the very least heavily injured. Whoa. 
when we get back to the action, the two are doing some big baseball bat swings at each other, though Blake is now also dual wielding her sword with her scabbard. It does have a blade on it, so while that makes it impossible to store safely, it can be used as a weapon. Although I really don't like how she's holding it in a reverse grip. Again, that just nerfs every conceivable thing that you'd want your weapon to be able to do. Blake gives ground, and they do the flashy but bad jumping attacks at each other. It looks visually impressive, but that sort of thing just isn't a good idea to do in a real fight. Jumping makes you very predictable. They then get into the bind once more, but this time they do the whole you push me, I push you thing. When two blades make contact, you can pivot them around that point to try to strike your opponent. Pushing doesn't do anything. Blake is also using an offshoot of the X block that you see a lot of the time when characters dual wield. That's when you use both weapons to block a single weapon from an enemy. You don't need to do that. It negates the advantage you have of dual wielding. Instead, she could have parried Adam's strike with either her sword or her scabbard, and then attacked him at the same time with the other. That's how dual wielding was used historically in duels. Instead, she just looks behind herself for some reason, and then disengages. Adam aggressively pursues, but right here, he left himself incredibly exposed. He tries to do this flipping slash, but left his whole back open. Blake could easily have struck him there. She then falls back and waits for him to attack again. Right here, she could easily have struck him with her scabbard blade, but instead she decides to use only her sword. Yes, that might not do as much damage as the sword, but every little bit helps. Blake then enters full retreat, swinging from tree to tree with her weapon. Really, this probably was slower than just running, but it is what it is. Adam then manages to disrupt her by launching his sword at hers, knocking it off course and allowing him to catch up. He's lucky that that fell right back to him. As Blake confronts him, she's at a big disadvantage here, as she's leading with her foot, while he could counter with a simple thrust. A blade beats an exposed leg. But Adam just takes the kick for some reason. Blake shoots at him, even hitting him a few times, though it produces no visible result, not even an aura flare. They then have a bit of a stare down, though I can't imagine why. Blake's bullets seem to be made out of tissue paper, and Adam doesn't try to shoot back or close the distance. The more you sit there, the more you let your enemy come up with a plan. Either engage or fall back. They emerge from the forest onto a natural land bridge, and Adam has now opted to dual wield as well, using his scabbard in his offhand, though he too uses it in a reverse grip. It doesn't have a blade on it like Blake's does, but it could still be useful for defense, or dealing a bit of damage and disorienting Blake. Blake does leave herself entirely exposed here, and all Adam would need to have done would be to thrust at her back, but he overswung. He does manage to shoot what he believes to be Blake, and we get a good look at his scabbard's gun form something that we haven't gotten in this fight. Where its extra mass goes is still a mystery though, but Blake's illusions have deceived him, 
And if she hadn't moved so far away, she could have capitalized on that. Instead, Adam has time to react to her and thrusts his weapon at her. Luckily for Blake, it slides right into her scabbard, and she's able to snatch it away from him. I'm guessing that the different blade geometries caused it to become stuck in there, as it doesn't just fly out when Blake flips around. Blake lunges back at Adam, dodging a shot and striking at him. Adam very nearly loses his gun here. Just look at that. This man has a serious case of butterfingers. Close your fingers, dude. He gets duped by another illusion and has to hop back to avoid being struck by Blake. Adam's weapon also seems to be a pea shooter here though, as Blake can easily stop its projectiles, with his kick being more effective here. He then converts his weapon into its scabbard form, opting to engage Blake in melee. Blake tries to do a leaping kick here, but Adam blocks it, and now she has no leverage, as she's not touching the ground. Adam might have been able to grab her leg and slam her down if he was quick enough. Instead, she flips over him, and he rushes her, trying to bludgeon her with his scabbard. Blake lets her wrist be grabbed again though, and now he's got leverage on her. This lets him retrieve his weapon, and get rid of one of Blake's at the same time. Grapples are dangerous. They make it difficult to use your weapon, and this is how most fist fights end. Don't let them grab you. Knee them, kick them, use a headbutt, something. Getting grabbed is very much bad news. But instead of maximizing his opportunity, Adam winds up a swing to a horrid degree, growling while he does so, letting Blake know exactly what he's doing. Unfortunately, she doesn't react to it. delusional. Adam then does a slow jumping attack, but his knocking Blake away does demonstrate why throwing opponents around can be a bad idea. You then have to close that distance again, which gives them time to prepare. If he'd struck her with the blade instead of the pommel and launched her, he could have quickly followed up. Blake had two opportunities to hit him here. The first was when he was splayed out in the air, the second was when he wound up afterwards. She decided to evade both times. Now I understand evasion, I did it quite a lot in sparring, but you need to attack back, else you're just stalling until you slip up. But his subsequent strike hits her weapon, and she just lies there for some reason. Get up. Being on the ground like that is one of the worst places you can be. Adam then strikes at her again, which somehow sends her sliding across the ground. Not sure how the physics of that worked out. Adam then uses his semblance to split Gamble Shroud in half. Keep that in the back of your mind, it will be important later. This shows us that his semblance can cut through metal. I'm not alone. Adam then winds up a super slow thrust in a reverse grip no less, with the blade pointing towards him for some strange reason. Thankfully, Blake has illusions and wasn't really there when he struck. He then gets hit by Yang's motorcycle, and he's fortunate that he wasn't carried off the cliff with it. At the speed it was going though, and with the distance it fell from, that had to have dropped Adam's aura, or at the very least weakened it substantially. Oddly, there have been no aura flashes throughout this fight, making me wonder whether that was an oversight, 
or if the characters have just been eating this damage without it. But I would like to question how Yang knew where Blake was. Was her plan to just drive off a cliff and hope for the best? She left her near the tower. Realistically, she shouldn't have been able to tell where exactly she was. Yang has now joined the fight though, and it's a 2v1. Being outnumbered is bad, no matter how skilled you are. Masters can be taken down by two lesser skilled opponents, as a pair can support one another, while the one alone has to receive the full brunt of attacks. You. Yang shoots it at him, but he can somehow block the attack. Now, don't Yang's gauntlets usually fire shotgun pellets that will spread? He shouldn't have been able to block all of them. Yang! Uh, it's okay. Catch your breath for a second. I could hold him off. She's right, Blake. It's okay. We have unfinished business. Blake then drops to the ground like she had actually been stabbed, but that was only the illusion. Why is she acting this way? If it was an old wound acting up again, then why haven't we seen that crop up before or since? Yang initially plays very defensively, blocking most of Adam's strikes while evading a few, but Adam seems to be toying with her a bit, as when she puts up a static guard, he only attacks it instead of going for her exposed sections. Adam then uses his semblance against Yang, but this either misses or has no effect, as Yang isn't damaged and doesn't move. He follows this up by throwing his sword again, and I would have laughed so hard if Yang had caught it. Seriously, don't throw your weapon. Yang blocks it, but he decides to throw it again, and she deflects it into the dirt. Unfortunately, he recovers it quickly and slashes at her. We can also see Blake just watching this go down. Why are you just sitting there? Do something. He's completely focused on Yang. If you aren't going to get in there, then at least use your semblance. Adam then projects what must be his semblance three times, which then knocks Yang back a bit. As Yang moves to re-engage, she does a good job at baiting out an attack from Adam, and then strikes him while he overswings again. She even manages to shoot and punch him, though the gunshot has zero effect on him, and the recoil doesn't cause her arm to shoot back, so that accomplishes little. She does land several good hits on him afterwards though, so good on her. And here we have the dichotomy of weapon ranges. Shorter weapons, in this case fists, are at a disadvantage unless they can get inside the reach of the longer weapon, in this case Adam's sword. That's why daggers weren't primary weapons in war. The reach disadvantage is just too extreme. In single combat, or small fights though, this can be an interesting dynamic. When I did martial arts, most of the guys I sparred with were much bigger than me, over six feet tall. They had a range advantage on me, but if I could bait out an attack and get inside their reach, then I had the advantage. Yang and Adam have a similar situation. If Adam can keep her within his sword's reach, then he has the advantage. If Yang can get inside it though, then she has the upper hand. Pun intended. But Yang manages to get a grasp on Adam's sword arm and delivers several good hits into his ribs, followed by a hook. Hits to the ribs can help gas someone out, making it difficult for them to breathe for a while. Adam seems to have a high level of endurance, 
so that can be valuable. Yang manages to put him on the defensive though, and Adam now has to respect her strikes. Before, he had completely disregarded her, but an opponent you underestimate very well could be the one to take you down, even if you are the better fighter. Admittedly, Yang also winds up horribly and leaves herself exposed, which Adam should have exploited. Instead, he blocks it and is sent sliding backwards. Yang then tries to kick him, but again, leading with your feet through the air, just tells Adam where you're going and when you're going to get there, and a sword thrust hurts more than a foot. But he blocks the strike, and Yang is then, weirdly, able to kick it aside and then kick him. If he had sidestepped, or simply held out his sword, he could have struck her down or caused her to skewer herself. Adam then absorbs Yang's ranged attacks, which I have to question where her shotgun blasts went, and then creates after images of himself, which then circle Yang alongside him. That was never something his semblance was described to do, so I haven't got a clue what's going on here. He then flies in from above somehow, and unleashes a blast against Yang. Really, how much energy can he store and for how long? With how often he's been abusing his semblance and the hits he's taken, he has to be running low on aura. Yang then succeeds again in baiting out an attack from Adam, then countering when he misses. Mind games are a powerful thing in fights. Adam continues to overswing, but then Yang evades and opts to do something rather strange. She launches herself into the air, already established to be a bad idea, and then delivers a punch to Adam's face. Adam even misses a point-blank shot while she's dropping towards him. I would like to point out that Yang's prosthetic might be a bit stronger than a regular fist. Metal does have less give to it than meat and bone, making her prosthetic possibly more like a mace than a fist. Yang strikes him several more times, but is eventually blasted away by his semblance-infused sword. Really, how much aura does this guy have? Adam then blasts her with his semblance again, and we can see that there are blackened gouges in her robotic arm. This makes me question whether it's protected by Yang's aura. If it was, then it shouldn't have been damaged without her aura being depleted. She's not protecting me, Adam. And I'm not protecting her. We're protecting each other. What? That was a wonky line. I believe the intention was to say that they're a team, rather than one defending the other, but that could have been written better. Something more along the lines of, We'll stand against you together! Or similar. This just sounds like a strange contradiction. If you're protecting each other, then yes, you are protecting her and she's protecting you. That's what that means. But now Blake and Yang finally use their numbers advantage, but strangely, they both opt to evade past Adam rather than one baiting him out for the other. Doesn't quite make use of your advantage there. Adam then goes after Yang, while Blake kicks him in the spine. Using her scabbard blade might have been more effective, but at least it's something. Adam ignores her though, instead trying to go for Yang again, who manages to pull off an elbow. I love elbows and knees, 
They're extremely effective if you can get in close enough to use them. Yang then ducks away, and Blake moves in while he's still got his attention on her, but her leaping attack, combined with her yell, alert him in time for him to evade. Blake then whiffs her next swing, and is forced to evade, but Adam slams his sword into the dirt like a total dweeb. But Blake then jumps over him instead of attacking him. Why? He wasn't able to stop you from hitting him. That was your chance. If you were waiting for the opportune moment, that was it. But then he just stands there to eat a kick from her. As he flies through the air like a wet noodle, Yang then leaps up and strikes him. Blake then keeps the pressure up, but she misses another chance to attack his exposed back. Though as he swings at her, Yang comes in with a hook. And this is precisely why being outnumbered is bad. Every time Adam turns to face one, the other can attack with a huge advantage. Blake then comes in with another kick, though how she circled back around in so short a time is anyone's guess. I'd love to have seen that in free cam to see what happened. She then does a series of back springs to retrieve the broken section of her sword, but it would have been faster and less obvious to just run over there. She hurls the weapon at Adam, who bats it aside without effort, but Yang grabs it and launches Blake in the slowest and most telegraphed attack they could have performed in that moment. Blake then just sort of hangs in the air somehow before Adam blasts her back. Interestingly, that was an omnidirectional blast, as he too is sent flying. Blake, however, hits the cliff and falls down onto a lower section of the rocks, and we get to see the first aura flare of this fight. I have no idea where they've been. Vacation, I guess. Adam then almost one for one, swings at Yang like a baseball player about to hit it out of the park, though his aim is off and she barely has to move to dodge it. He follows with a clumsy reverse grip swing, and then performs a slow kick that gave Yang plenty of time to strike before it hit, but she instead chose to block. But she's thrown off balance by it, and eats another one. She then dodges around his subsequent three strikes, the last one including a slow spin that left him exposed. He then knocks her away with a headbutt. Your aura's bound to be running low. <sighs> he then taunts her by claiming that her aura must be low. Pot, meet Kettle. You've been taking shots like an alcoholic at the bar and have been spamming your semblance. You have to be running on fumes by this point. Blake is then seen climbing up the cliff. Note that she is above the other two right now. That'll come up in a second. What does she even see in you? Yang simply stands there avoiding a few attacks, but being hit a few times as well. This will be played off as a clever move in a minute, but getting hit deliberately is almost never a good idea. You're just passively taking damage, and when someone has a sword, that's game over once you run out of aura. Adam then lays into her with his semblance, but Yang catches his blade. Remember when I mentioned Adam cutting Gamble Shroud in half? Well, now that comes into play. 
Why couldn't he cut through Yang's prosthetic fingers? He was demonstrated to cut through metal, and he even damaged her arm just a few moments ago, but somehow he fails to accomplish that here. What gives? Gotcha. Yang then sends him a flying with a half punch to his ribs, empowered by both her semblance and a shotgun blast, and we can finally see Adam's aura break. Really, we should have been seeing those flash up throughout this fight, but they only now come into play for some reason. I may not be faster, but I'm smarter. This, however, has deprived him of his weapon. Yang also claims to be smarter here, but the mechanics of how this works are janky. He was established to be able to damage metal and her prosthetic arm, so why didn't that work all of a sudden? We even see Yang's aura break too. Weird, seeing as she only recently showed up. You'd think that she'd have more left over than the other two. Yang then throws Adam's sword off of the cliff, and as he reaches for it, Blake erupts from the pit, punching him in the face. She was above them a minute ago. How did she get down there? Adam also clearly saw her as his expression changed, yet he made no effort to defend himself. All three parties then rush for the remains of Blake's weapon, but the members of Team Ruby reach them first, and both get plunged into Adam's torso, killing him and concluding this fight. So overall, this was a bit of a mixed bag. There were some nice moments, but the overswinging and missed opportunities really took their toll on this fight. Adam spammed his semblance a lot, but Blake could have made use of hers more often. But what did you think of this sequence? Did you enjoy it, or did it leave you wanting more? Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and leave a like on this video if you're so inclined, and subscribe to see more. I would like to thank you for watching, and may you all have a weapon in each hand.